Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm very happy to see everybody here. I, I'm very happy to be starting this next to final episode of the series that we have now run for a, uh, a year from a poet's point of view. Uh, so certainly welcome to the Prince George's County Office of the Poet Laureate and uh, well, our monthly celebration that brings poets of repute, poets of excellence, poets that have something to say and say it well. This is uh, a monthly series that's been virtual because of course the pandemic. And um, let me introduce our guest, but I'll first introduce myself for those that might have joined us and not know who is who. My name is Sister Joy. I'm the Poet Laureate of, of uh, Prince George's County. Uh, today's event is presented by the Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council with support and in partnership with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, the Prince George's County Memorial Library System, and the Nora Roberts Foundation. Now, we greatly appreciate uh, and thank them for their support. I also want to take this time uh, as we begin to thank Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council intern, Howard Phillips, who is our technical guru for today, he is providing all the technical support <clears throat> for today's event, along with, and I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Prince George's Arts and Humanities uh, Council Director of Development and, <clears throat> and Community Grants, Sherry Moore. Uh, Sherry, thank you so much for your continued support for this series. Um, I want to make sure if there are any other members of the council present that I acknowledge them. So if, uh, if anybody else with Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council is present, please unmute and say hello so I can acknowledge you publicly. And I take that to mean that we are a go with the members that are here. Thank you so much. This is, as I said earlier, the 11th episode of our virtual monthly poetry series taking place every third Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. And I thank each of our guests for joining us. And I certainly thank our guest poets for joining us. Now, at this monthly event, poets both present their poetry and also discuss the significance of the particular issues that, well, that brought them to write those particular poems. Uh, we want to make sure that our guests know that we would love for you to post comments or questions in the Zoom chat so that we can know from you when we're hitting the mark, when we're missing the mark, and we can go back and address any questions or concerns that you may have during our conversation. Uh, and it is an open forum. So although I may direct a particular question to you know, a specific poet, our three poets have license to uh, respond uh, in kind. So although, as I said, we do have three poets and those poets are Patty Ross. Patty, thank you for joining us today for From a Poet's Point of View. Also, we have with us Cliff Bernier. Clifford? Cliff Bernier is certainly no stranger to anyone here in uh, Prince George's County and well, well, well beyond. And we're also excited that today we have a, uh, a young voice with us, a younger voice with us. I'm speaking of Joran Ellison, who is a Prince George's County Youth Poetry Ambassador. And Joran, welcome and thank you so much for joining us, each of the three of you. Thank you so much. Now, um, what I'd like for each of you to do is uh, to feel free to present your poetry that you feel addresses the issues of significance to you and, and well, share why that particular topic is relevant to you. So um, although it may be something specific to one of you, all three of you may want to weigh in on the topic at hand. So uh, 
we want to make sure that we talk about things like how poets conceive and, and craft poetry that is powerful and engaging. And, and for those who choose to write poems of social conscience, and we realize that not everybody does, but how do you feel that poetry can be a tool for social change? So that's, again, a question, an issue that some folks take issue with. They say poetry and politics shall never meet. That's not the camp where I live, but uh, want to hear from you what it is that you feel. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, things like how does the poet get from the genesis or the inspiration uh, to that final stage of uh, performance and publication? So we're, we're going to go beyond just the written. We want to talk about the uh, various elements of inspiration, we want to talk about the writing, we want to talk about the uh, performance and also the publication. So some uh, may have more information than others, but these are topics that folks want to know. They want to know how does the life of a poet, you know, how does that really work? So as I said to our guest, we have three poets and today we're going to um, start with uh, Patty Ross. Patty, yes, Patty is going to be our first poet that we hear from, and I'll start by sharing some bio information about Patty, uh, such that uh, our uh, well, our audience members may want to uh, post questions or comments after hearing her conversation uh, partnered with her bio information. So Patty Ross graduated from Washington, D.C.'s Duke Ellington School for the Performing Arts and the American University. After graduation, several of her journalist pieces were published in the Washington Times and also the Rural America newspapers. Retiring from a career in technology, Patty has discovered her love of writing and shares her voice as the spoken word artist named Little Pie. Uh, her poems are published in the Pen in Hand journal, Poetry X Hunger website, Oyster Review Pages Composite Dreams uh, issue. Now, her debut chapbook, St. Paul Street Provocations, was published in July 2021 by Yellow Arrow Publishing. And uh, for those that are interested, and, and uh, Little Pie, if you would put your blog in the chat so that people can have that. Uh, her blog is uh, littlepiesuniverse.com. But uh, she'll put that in the chat so you can access it at any time. And for those that are familiar with Zoom, you know that you can save the chat after we've concluded our program and be able to refer back to any links or any information that appears in the chat. And uh, we'll talk about that before we close, just for those that may be newer to Zoom and don't know how to save the chat. But anyway, topics that most often drive your writing are advocacy related. So uh, topics such as the Poor People's Campaign, homelessness, the history of the enslaved, specifically African-American legacy. Little Pie, tell us, what is it that brings you to that point where you just must put pen to paper? <laughs> so, um, well, I've actually been writing for a while since I was um, younger doing poetry and, and it started with doing poems for funerals, right? When, when wow. relatives would pass, you know, I, I, you know, I got my emotions out and I think, I don't know if it was my mom or somebody, somebody saw one one time and said, oh, you've got to read this at the funeral. So then every time somebody passed away, they said, are you going to write a poem? Are you going to do a poem? Are you going to do a poem? <laughs> <laughs> so since I was little, um, I started with that. And then, um, um, but what I found was that um, poetry is really an opportunity to give a voice somewhat to the voiceless and to provide uh, information in a sort of succinct way that people will, um, hopefully they can, they can, you know, they'll, they'll grasp it, they'll enjoy it. Um, and not only is it 
sort of, you know, uh, yes, it's enjoyable and lovely and this and that, but there's also a message within it. At least that's for me and my, my poetry. Um, Little Pie is uh, the name that I use, which um, is sort of my, you know, sort of stage name when I'm doing um, spoken word. And that is um, in paying homage to my great, great grandmother, who um, in 19, about 1889, 19, um, I'm sorry, 1899, 1900, she walked uh, several miles over from probably what was previously her, what was her, uh, the plantation that she was on to where my grand, my, my great grandmother was with uh, my grandfather and his two sisters um, uh, in the house on the plantation where they lived. And she gave them a portrait of themselves um, that somehow she had had made and we still have it in the family. And when she gave it to them, she said, because um, I, if you ever get sold back into slavery, I want you to know who your family is. I want you to know who your family is. Yeah, and we still have that. Um, that uh that uh portrait what still. a blessing um, wow yeah so little pie is sort of the voice for her because from what i understand from my mom and other folks she was quite you know uh spicy and so uh <laughs> so i uh what? i take okay. that to honor her yeah and to be able to say the things that i feel like in some ways um you know, she would want to say, um, and others like her would want to say. Um, I can kind of give you a little bit of background with one of my poems, if you want me to read. That would be great. Right? Yes, let's let's hear a poem to to see the spiciness that has yeah. carried down through the generations. Well, there you go. And so, uh, so one of the poems is uh, the one I'm going to read is called History Month, and this is about Black History Month, of which I hate Black History Month. And the reason that I don't like Black History Month is because history should be told in its sincere in its, its succinctness, right? And I think we're having that discussion right now when we're talking about critical race theory and what's going on, right? And so that's one of my issues with Black History Month. And so of course I wrote a poem about it. Um, I started out with an African proverb that says, however far a stream flows, it doesn't forget its origins. <clears throat> But what of my history got to be only one month long? Didn't we suck from the same breast and sing the same songs? We was both in that wash bucket, your dirt and mine intertwined. Said we was brothers, till master said no. I'm in the fields trying to forget that you laid your head on my mama's lap. Why my history got to be only one month long? Isn't there a lot to tell from the 400 years riding the prairie alongside you? Christmas took the first bullet for our flag, so you leave me confused. How can I not be patriotic? That's the thinking of those psychotic. You see, my ancestors' bones are the sand you sink your feet in at the beach, gazing across the water to their last loving memory. One month of history? Mm -mm. Their story is too long and too strong for that. Why my history got to be only one month long? Even though we pray to the same God, how did he give you privilege and turn his back on me? Was it when you made me black and hang from the poplar tree? Was it the week you burned down Tulsa, making Black Wall Street subprime? Or was it the day we started school, your old books, now mine? Or maybe the day they closed the library because I was in line? Why my history got to be only one month long? You planning to shoot me in the back 16 times again or leave me out of the game to die on the sidelines? 28 days is not enough time to explain the pain of living invisible and being called out your name. 28 days is not enough time to explain why your mammy, my mama, got the same man. It's too short a time to explain that this land is my land built by black hands. Why my history got to be only one month long? Is it because when the cage bird sings her song, the shouts from Louisiana's Angola ring so strong? Or is it because if the truth be told, you owe me for selling my people's soul? Why my history got to be on a one month long? Oh my goodness. Wonderful, wonderful, Thank wonderful, you. wonderful, Thank wonderful. You. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, that poem says it all. That I yeah. would imagine that to be your signature poem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it probably it probably is. Um, 
um, there's a line in the poem about the library closing, and that's a true story. Uh, my mother, who uh, grew up in a little town in uh, North Carolina, Weldon, North Carolina, um, when they finally allowed the black kids to go to the library um, and get library cards, they all went over to the library to get the library cards because the teachers had sent them from the school. And the librarian was a little bit taken aback and she didn't want to give them cards. And mm -hmm. they called and they were basically forced to have to give them all cards. And my mother said she got her cards and they all went home and they were all waiting to go to the library so they could pick up their books and they closed the library that very next day. Wow. She still has her card and she's never used it at that library. Oh my God. The building still stands in Weldon, North Carolina. They closed it down because the black kids were going to have to come to the, come into the public library. So that's why I say history's got to be history. We've got to tell it the way it really is and not hold back. And had we been doing that all along, then we wouldn't be into these crazy discussions that we're having now um yeah about you know critical race theory so. exactly exactly and that's the thing the truth will tell the story that's all all you have to do it's not something that has to be created it's not something that has to be debated it's just tell the truth mm -hmm. and uh there are so many that want to bury the truth but it is america's story it absolutely is America's story. Well, thank you for sharing that particular piece. That's a perfect introduction uh, to you because uh, just from what I know of you, I say, okay, that I if I had seen that on a on a paper somewhere, I would put your name to it. <laughs> so certainly, uh, that that's exciting to to know that you you write your truth in such a way that it is absolutely just that. Um, is there a specific audience that you write to when you're when you're writing poems or is it um, well yeah is there a, a specific audience that you consider yourself writing to um no not really a particular audience that oh, i'm writing to i think that i try to um as I said before, I think I try to give a little bit of voice to the voiceless. Um, I'm an advocate for the Poor People's Campaign. Um, that, that started with my mother years ago. Um, and that's always been because, you know, uh, people have nothing to do. Poverty is poverty. And mm -hmm. it has very little to do with the individuals that are caught up in that cycle of poverty, right? And so, um, so the idea that somebody has, um, that somebody, you know, put that upon themselves is just, in my opinion, sort of ridiculous. So um, so I think that what I try to do is just bring light to certain subjects and topics and things like that. Um, I also think that now that, you know, I'm of the age that I am, I don't know if I would have, uh, you know, if I would have had my 20 year old career self uh, out here saying some of the things that I say now, because as you know, Joy, we I've gotten into some debates over reparations and a whole bunch of stuff you've been on. <laughs> Yes. So, so yes. I don't know that I would be, but I figure now, you know, uh, this uh, is I can the time. Of, this is <laughs> this the is, time. This Absolutely. is the time. Exactly. And yeah. so, um, and, so and, uh, that's, that's one of the blessings of being able to grow into that point of wisdom of understanding, you know, everything is not for every time and everything is not even for everybody, but truth exactly. always sets you free. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very, very happy for you that you have found the freedom that allows you to speak your truth in such a powerful yeah. and beautiful way. So yeah, thank you. For that. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit about your debut collection, St. Paul Street Provocations. Yeah. So this is the collection. Oh, let's see, here we go. This is the, this is the collection. Um, and um, it was it was born out of a time that I lived in the city. I actually lived on St. Paul Street, um, St. Paul and Lafayette Streets, if you're familiar with Baltimore at all. Um, this was in Baltimore and um, it's one block south of North Avenue. And um, at that intersection is a little park and the park oh, there, there's behind me and the park um, was um, really dilap dilapidated and you know there were needles in there and everything like that and the group came through and kind of cleaned it up a little bit and the uh, I guess you can see the the cover is what was painted it's no longer there now um, uh, it's been it's sort of been worn over but that is by um, these women muralists, um, Jesse and uh, and Katie and it's called the game so it's kind of interesting because the area where I lived 
you definitely had to know how to play the game. And it was um, um, one, um, one block over one block down was a halfway house around the corner were a couple of meth labs um and then one block south was another um another halfway house so it was kind of interesting for me because um it uh i, I had no idea i had just moved into the city hoping to sort of you know find myself and um but i had my dog and i had to um walk my dog at night and in the process of walking my dog at night i had an opportunity to meet a lot of different people and um and i called you know friends and mainly people who were living on the street or otherwise and um and as i was walking the dog you know people always like to gravitate towards a dog we just started having conversations and in having those conversations um, some of the poems came out of that and one of the poems that um, kind of along with the whole poor people thing is homeless and it's and it's actually H O M E slash L E S S. I don't know if you can see that. Oh. It's like could that. You, it's not. Homeless. Could you give us that poem now? I will. I'll read this poem for you. Oh, um, okay. And it came out of a story that I was talking with. Um, there's a guy who lives at MLK, Martin Luther King um, Avenue and um, Fayette Streets. And I would take that to go to work every day. And, um, and a couple of times, you know, the lights, you have to sit through two or three. And we had, we got to talking. And at one point he disappeared. And I said to him, I said, D, he's called him Darnell. I said, D, what, what happened? And he said, man, that easy, you know, I'm out here. I'm already dealing with the demons in my head. And now I got to deal with like the demons at night. I got beat up and yada, yada, yada. And, and so um, in, in some ways, um, you know, so he, he basically told me that story and about three, about, a, I guess, a, a, either that evening or the next evening, I went to a um, neighborhood watch meeting. And at that neighborhood watch meeting, um, they were talking about the homeless. And, um, and, you know, and I tend to kind of, I don't know, I don't know if this woman thought I was homeless or what, I don't know, because I tend to be a little bit relaxed in my, in my dress at oftentimes, and um, about halfway through the meeting, and, uh, and I will tell you, I was the only, I believe I was the only minority, there might have been another person of color in there, I'm not sure, um, I did not see them, but about halfway through the meeting, this woman leaned over to me and she said, why are you here? And I was just like, what? Oh, wow. Why am I here? Yeah. And it's, and it was wow. in like one of the, anyway, so this is homeless and it starts with an epithet from Proverbs 29 uh, verses one uh, verse 13, the poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives sight to the eyes of both. So somebody asked me, why are you here? Let me be clear. I'm here for those who couldn't be here, should be here, full of fear lack of ear, dumb luck. Anyway, I stand here for them. I'm here for those that are riding high, ready to die. I stand here for the man or the woman who sits on the side of society's lines, hides daily or rides in the back of a streetcar named Desire because they couldn't get hired or they got fired and things got tough and the streets got rough. And now getting older, the streets get colder. Having nowhere to lay their head until they are dead and the city reclaims them and puts them in a plot of land they might have had all along. Might have the chains have changed from the demons that reign. Had they had that little plot, that dirt lot to call their own, instead they remain homeless. Now, now we, we about the business of making money, keeping our eyes on it, keeping our minds on it and ignoring the bodies piling up on the streets that we drive and the park benches that we sit. You see, we, we, we know all the hymns and the Thames while ignoring those on the street dying and losing limbs. So yeah, somebody asked me, why am I here? I'm here for those that live with the demons of street life, not knowing whether they get beat down tonight and die in the glow of a homeless light. So let me ask you, why are you here? Yes. Oh my goodness, I love it, I love it. And I'm so glad you ended it with that. That That is the absolute, what we must do, we must turn it back. We absolutely, so oftentimes, uh, we, we will uh, ingest the uh, that vitriol that is directed to us when in fact, we just need to turn it back and, and, and allow them to really, if they have any consciousness whatsoever, to hear 
and receive what it is that they're spewing in the universe. Thank you so much, Patty, uh, little pie. Yes. <laughs> uh, can you please put in the chat uh, the, the name of your book mm -hmm. and uh, the link of where it can be purchased? If Certainly if it can be purchased online, ideal but how they can uh, support you as a poet. And, and I'm saying this for uh, all of our guests that we very much encourage and request that you support these poets. They are really doing great work for our community and uh, the works that you hear, uh, I've not heard them prior to the show. I trust anytime I bring a guest on, I'm gonna trust that what they're gonna present is appropriate for the forum that we share. So uh, I have never been let down. This is now a pro, we're now into literally the fourth year. And uh, these poets have such stellar work. I'm so honored to have them on the show. And uh, Little Pie, your poetry today has been exemplary. Uh, certainly for those of us that have that uh, consciousness mode about us as we travel as poets, uh, your work is the shining star of what it is we're, we're aspiring to do. So thank you oh, so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to share. And of course, Joy, you and I have gotten to know each other well, and this has just been a beautiful, beautiful experience. So thank you. And thank you for the platform that you do. I know we'll do all that probably at the end, but, um, but thank you so much. Well, I, I want to make sure that uh, it, how and why did you decide to give power to your voice through poetry? Let me not overlook that significant question. I always want to know what brings a person to poetry. And, and you didn't just come to write pretty words. What, what gave you that, that, you know, that... You, you that it's really, it's, you know, I grew up in DC, which is, you know, where it's sort of a lot of politics, a lot, you know, this, a lot of politics, that's pretty much the conversation of the day all the time when you're coming up um, in that area. And so I was, you know, so when I look at how do I want to create change and create awareness of what's going on, then I figure that I can do it through my poetry. You know, we write a lot of our poems for ourselves, right? Because we are, you know, frustrated with a situation or it's a way to put our emotions on paper. Um, and so then I just decided that, you know, eh, I'm, 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 I'm pretty tough skin. So I'll get out there and say what I'm actually thinking um, sometimes. And I think I was, I, I, started and sent it to a couple of audiences and I thought they were going to throw tomatoes at me because it was not well they weren't traditional spoken word audiences um right okay. they were more literary audiences and and yeah. and then they said no they said you know this is great and um and they wanted to hear it and so I think that just helped me to sort of look for ways to refine the message you know and to get it out there and so that's what I've been trying to do um and then I love poetry myself, right? Like I'm just a lover of poetry and, and to hear others. So I'm excited, you know, I wanna hear what Cliff's gonna have to say, and you know, <laughs> Jenny's gonna have to say. Um, of course, I love your poetry. So I just love it myself too. And, and, and so a part of it, I feel like sometimes is a little bit selfish because I'll have readings, you know, or I'll do the open mic and like, really? It's so I can hear everybody's poetry too. <laughs> so. Out of, hey, that's what it's, it's enough to go around for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we, we very much uh, acknowledge that uh, there, there are uh, reasons that we write, there are reasons that we share, there are reasons that we don't share some things that we write. Uh, but it is, uh, the reality is that uh, one of the things that I aspire to do as Poet Laureate for the county is to uh, bring communities together and uh, allow a divergence of voices where people can understand or at least have the opportunity to understand why uh, certain issues are in the fore. Uh, certainly um, there is a, well, there's a dichotomy really because you have the community of poetry that is, as you said, literary. Mm -hmm. And then there is the community of poetry that is very much, uh, connected with the street vernacular mm -hmm. it very much deals with the issues of the grassroots and uh i don't know i've been able to navigate both but not everybody does and there is some some uh need for 
for there to be a crossing of those mm -hmm. borders. Yes. You cannot, you can't make any headway. And, and I believe that poets are the change agents. I absolutely yes. do. So we, we can't make any progress if everybody stays in their quote unquote lane, if that's even a concept in poetry, because we wanna make sure that there is a discussion, that uh, the views are shared and that's how understanding occurs. So <laughs> yeah, I think- the, I was just gonna say, one of the things that we've been doing is with visual artists too. And um, one of the, I mean, this guy is a muralist and um, his name is, is Jay Hudson. And he talks about cross-pollination all the time. And I was thinking about that and I'm like, that's what we do, right? As poets, we're always cross-pollinating and, and bringing in others and, and enjoying others. And of course, that's what you do too, Sister Joy. So thank you so much. Oh, you're um, this very was a, well. This was a pleasure. I did put my, um, I put the, my blog site in the chat and also the book um, can be uh, purchased through Yellow Arrow Publishing. Um, and that is a women's um, publishing group out of Baltimore. Um, and they publish both poetry and creative nonfiction. Um, and if there's any poets with chapbooks um, waiting to be published, I think they're open right now for chapbook submission. Okay. So you might want to check them out. Okay. Can you put their website in there? Oh, I see yellow. Yeah, okay. it is. Yeah, that's there. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, wonderful. We want to make sure that all the poets that are in the audience uh, make, pay, uh, pay attention to the chat. And uh, make note, uh, we'll talk about saving the chat later so you don't have to write all these things down unless you feel like you, you don't have difficulty with it. But uh, thank you for that information. Uh, congratulations on your first book and uh, much continued success. We'll definitely look forward to um, uh, hopefully letting the community know about where you'll be performing before we get off this Zoom today. Great. Okay, so we'll be coming back to Little Pie. Patty Ross, and uh, we, we greatly appreciate the information that you've shared today, Patty. Thank you so much. Okay, now, uh, and let's see, let me double check our Zoom. I don't see any questions. Someone requested that you put your info in the chat. You have done that. Uh, I see fantastic work, wow, uh, has been expressed by Lady Di and uh, Miss Cayenne, that was beautiful little pie. That was your first poem. So you have many applause, hands, claps, and all of that over there, snaps and claps in the, in the chat. So people are feeling you. That's great. That's what we want. That's what we want. Okay, well, we are now moving on to our second guest poet, which will be our youth poetry ambassador, Joran Ellison. We are so very ha happy to have you with us. Welcome, Joran. And yeah, okay, um, go ahead. Uh, I'm just honored to be here um, and thank you for the platform. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, Joran is uh, certainly a young woman who has been doing some wonderful things with her poetry. I've uh, seen her in a couple of different forums and I'm very happy that she was able to join us today. Let me share some information about Joran before we get into an actual conversation with her. Uh, Joran Ellison is a, um, let's see, she's a senior at Frederick Douglass High School, where she is a student in the International Baccalaureate Program. She is a co-founder of the Positive Outlook Club at her school, which aims to create safe spaces within her school community and one of Prince George's County's current youth poetry ambassadors, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, she is also a part of her school's peer forward team in which she helps her peers to apply to colleges and aids them in creating their after school, well, after high school plans. Uh, Joran loves many of the modes of expression humanity has created from film to writing, from writing to drawing, from drawing to painting. She expresses for everyone, well, she wishes for everyone to find their creative inner child and create. Uh, now she is, as I said earlier, the youth, the, she is a 2021 
youth poetry ambassador with dialect of Prince George's, primarily serving her community of Clinton, Maryland. Jordan was a member of the 2021 Youth Services Poetry Corps of Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And she participated in the five week virtual poetry and collage, what well, may have been collage and poetry, I'm not sure, but which was part of the Summer Youth Employment Program. Joran, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time. Clearly you have a lot that you're doing these days. We're very happy that you could be with us. <laughs> thank you. Um, oh, all right, but thank you. I'm really honored to be here, um, especially with all of these other poets that I haven't really been exposed to as much. Um, and then I'm really grateful to be here. Well, thank you. Well, we, there are a couple of things that I know I'd like to find out about uh, concerning uh, the, the journey of a young poet who has decided not just to pursue poetry, but to become an ambassador for poetry, which is really putting yourself out there on the platform to, to be a spokesperson uh, beyond your own voice. Uh, I understand as a youth poetry ambassador, you're called upon for community events and uh, by uh, county leaders. Tell us what does it mean to be a youth poetry ambassador here in Prince George's County? Um, for me, it's been a very um, self-reflective but interesting journey. Um, for me, with self becoming a youth poet ambassador allowed me to like gain confidence in my own thoughts because when I created poetry originally, it was just for myself. Um, as Little Pai said that she also kind of created poetry. It's usually just for yourself in the beginning, um, just to get your own emotions out, your own feelings on things, um, to organize your own thoughts. And to share that with other people um, can sometimes be uh, nerve wracking because you don't know how others will take it. You don't know if others will agree, but I think that that's part of the point is to um, especially when it comes to poetry advocating for others, you know that other people may not agree with certain, certain, certain issues, such as like, like some people have different thoughts on immigration or, right. um, yeah. So I think part of poetry is speaking on those issues and helping to, I don't want to necessarily say change, but to influence other people to think of different perspectives and see other people's thoughts in hopes that they will be more open-minded and um, more caring and potentially advocate later for, them, for themselves, for others. Um, okay, well, certainly as far as a poet, part of what we must do is also to pay attention to those voices that are out there. So have you found yourself uh, changing your views on issues that have come to your attention by virtue of the advocacy of others or whether they be poets or politicians or educators or uh, wherever the source may be. Because as, uh, as a poet, we cannot certainly cannot come to the table saying that we have all the answers. But are, can, can you think of any particular time that you... Uh, were swayed in your thinking by uh, the outcome or the events of the day, uh, or just uh, things that you previously felt one way and then discovered, uh, well, maybe that's not the whole picture. So have you had that experience yet? Uh, yes, ma'am. I have definitely changed my views a lot on certain topics. Um, in school, in my global issues class, we tend to have a lot of debates on um, global issues. And so one time we were discussing, that currently there is a, um, currently, I don't know if many people know, but there is a lot of human rights violations going on around the world, but particularly in China with the Uyghurs, um, which is a Muslim uh, minority group in China. And they're, the Chinese government is handling it 
in a way which most people believe is a human rights violation. And so, so we were debating on whether or not the global community should um, intervene. And at first glance, um, many of our classmates and whatnot, um, many of our many of my classmates and us or in me were thinking it well if everyone intervenes, if the United States, for example, were to intervene, how would that impact the United States? Um, we could potentially end up in a war or something with China, which would um, obviously severely hurt our economy and hurt our own citizens. But um, after the debate, realizing how there are multiple ways to intervene, there are multiple ways to advocate, to help others. You don't necessarily need to bomb or invade another country to um, sway them to do something, to sway them to help others and stop violence. You can do things such as like embargoes or sanctions on um, specific countries or try to bar them from trading with others or just in general advocating um, to other people in those countries in hopes that they would advocate in their country like towards their government um, to stop certain human rights violations such as right. the creation camps and whatnot that they kind of humanistic in their approach to issues right okay well i i see that you are well suited for the uh title of ambassador uh poetry or otherwise you you're being you're addressing you're being presented with some uh global issues that uh, a lot uh, of adults aren't even aware of so so thank you for for being that voice that uh, has some expertise that comes to the table, not just the passion. And a lot of times, uh, you know, we poets are uh, claim, well, we're, we're chastised because we are seemingly ruled by passion. But uh, when we have the information and the facts to go along with it, then we have the basis upon which we have a right to go forward and speak our truth, not just based on uh, the emotion, but on the uh, realities of what the situation is. So thank you for that insight right there. Now, when I talk about poetry uh, of inspiration, what is it that uh, you find inspires you most to write poetry? Um, and even if you wanted to reference some particular poets that have inspired you as well. Well, as for like specific poets, definitely, the works of um, Nikki Giovanni and um, Sonny Patterson tend to inspire me a lot. But um, in terms of issues or what usually makes me want to put pen to paper is oftentimes personal experiences or um, different issues that kind of just hurt me to my core, hurt me to my core. Um, what hurts you to your core? What hurts Joran to her core? <laughs> um, oftentimes human rights violations um, and anything typically involving, I don't know if it's because I am uh, growing into adulthood myself, but still uh, really seen as a child. Uh, so anything involving children, whenever uh, children are placed in unsafe situations or um, I, I, don't, I feel as though everyone, no matter their age, but especially children should have access to um, safe spaces and safe homes. So, yes. yes. Okay, okay. Well, that uh, there, you have a lot of uh, company in that camp. Trust me, trust me. Um, talk to us about the different styles of poetry. Uh, some feel that there are styles that are relevant and germane to generations in particular, but Talk, talk to me about uh, the style. First of all, how would you identify your style of poetry? And maybe after uh, hearing a little bit about your view on styles of, of poetry between generations, maybe then we could hear our first poem from you. Um, my style of poetry, I think I'm oftentimes, the way I speak or the way I perform my poems is, or, and write them, is very much like a storytelling um, okay. joy. A narrative style. Yes, taking people on a on a journey, um, trying to help up 
people to envision what I'm trying to um, say. Like I would like people to, the, the goal is for people to have a um, movie in a sense playing in their mind when, when they hear my words. Uh, oh, okay. I, with my uh, words, that's it. Okay, well, how about we hear? Uh, take us on a journey. Let us see the narrative styles of Joran Ellison, introdu introducing you to a new audience. Joran, welcome. Thank you. Um, this poem is entitled To Be a Martyr. Uh, this poem I originally wrote when um, I first heard about mass refugee, um, the mass refugee issue going on in the world. There's a lot, especially as of recently, I don't know if anyone's watched the news, um, but with the refugee crisis at the border between Belarus and Poland, um, most of those refugees are from the Middle East. And this um, poem is geared to those, is, was inspired by those refugees. Um, most refugees in the mass refugee crisis are from the Middle East due to the amount of war going on right now there. But um, okay. it's be a martyr. Fresh blood makes the executioner's clothes as bright as the sun or the moon or the flash of the gun before her son takes his last breath. The people back home praise him for his sacrifice. But is it as honorable if he didn't want to be there in the first place? A 15 year old thrown into service for his country. After his flawed attempt to escape too early an invitation to adulthood, he began to lose faith in God, but still managed to fight good enough in hopes his elders were right about the sunny paradise where Allah had prepared a meal special for him and his fallen kin, friends whom had swallowed the bitter gift of guns and bombs, so much so rockets grew from their arms and they rejoiced at the sound of the boom, blew so much smoke from their young lungs, they could no longer see their futures when they looked up at the ceilings of their rooms, wombs spilling blood. The dead whisper, you come into this world just as violently as you leave martyrs made from not yet men, as, the youth, as their youth lead protests, hoping to end the war before communists, kids, women not wearing veils and honest men fighting to keep their families humanity can be awarded their tickets to the pearly gates. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Okay, so, uh, and how long ago did you write that? Mm, that one was written about two months ago um, after reading I think I forgot the name of the book, but it was a book um, discussing the Iranian revolution. Um, okay. okay, okay. Well, when you, um, when you look at this country, are, are there issues that come, that, that really, you know, touch your soul uh, that you've written about? Uh, is there perhaps something that is close to home or that you would care to share at this time? For me, um, a lot of the issues surrounding um, our recent, our recent with the George Floyd protests and um, a lot of the police brutality going on right now. Mm -hmm. There have been many poems written, but also um, one I would like to read is it's kind of short though, but it's okay. one my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather grew up in uh, North Carolina during um, the Jim Crow South and experienced a lot of racial violence. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that connects, that's what grounds me to, more to this country, I guess, and connects me more um, to just experience, being wary of where I go. Oh, that sounds bad, but- um, But it's the, rea the reality of the world not just that you as a young person, but that we all live in. So um, poetry doesn't always feel good. And that's that's the part of the reason why we have to have poetry. So please do share uh, the next poem, Joran. Looking into your look into your dark brown eyes, filled with spots of sadness and hints of rage, I see the journey. How you fought to be here so I could be here. Only your mirror knows your secrets. 
Only your sheets know the taste of your tears. Only your room knows the sound of your cries, too tough to show all of the cracks. Wouldn't want me to know all of the pain. Wouldn't want it to spread to me. You must stand in front of the raging tsunami, blocking me from the crashing waves, shielding me from the shadows of the dead things. My own personal dam. Protection is all you know when it comes to me. Protection built out of lack thereof in childhood. Roses and white picket fences replaced with white sheets and thorns, but I choose to build you a new fence and grow you a new garden. Thank you. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. Thank you. Grow you a new garden. Um, thank you so much. Now, uh, we want to make sure, uh, Joran, I know you're younger than uh, some of the poets that we typically have on, but is there a website where your work is available? Is there a publication uh, that, that features some of your works? Is there something you can add to the chat to let our people be in touch with you? Um, I can provide my email in the chat as well as my Instagram, which is Joran the Storyteller in the chat. Um, the 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 Camarian uh, the 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 Camarian project has featured some of my uh, stories. Okay. Um, not many of my poems, though. Usually, okay. just well, uh, short uh, stories are fine. Uh, if you can add, uh, you know, your contact the the information on where they can uh, read some of your work, that would be wonderful to add to the chat. And uh, we we greatly appreciate you being with us today. I want to make sure, is there anything that you particularly would like to share um, about uh, your journey as poet, uh, po youth poetry ambassador, or uh, just as a poet of today's era, and what you'd like to see happen through poetry? Mm, I would like to see more. Um, I think with the grown, especially with Amanda Gorman's performance at um, during the inauguration. Um, I think that poetry is becoming more visible and hopefully with the, with more people having eyes on poetry and poets that people will begin to open their ears um, and listen. Um, mm -hmm. Advocacy um, that is often littered throughout different poets, poems. Okay. Well, certainly, um, Keeping poetry in the fore is very much something that I, I've been passionate about for actually decades now. Uh, but certainly as poet laureate for Prince George's County, uh, one of the things that is currently an option uh, is that poets may, in the Prince George's County and surrounding what we call DMV, DC, Maryland, and Virginia area, may apply to have their works considered for publication in a new anthology uh, that will be titled when po well, Poets That Dance With Words. And uh, I'm gonna ask if Sherry is still on the line, if you can uh, please put the link in the chat for persons that want to apply to have their works considered. The, um, the call for poems is open until December the 4th, uh, maybe December the 3rd, I'm not sure which, I think it's December the 3rd, but you may, uh, poets uh, from the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia area, may submit up to three poems for consideration of publication. Uh, we may select one, we may select two, we may select three, or we may select none, but we want to make sure that all poems are submitted in a timely manner. So again, the call for poems is from the Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council. And uh, you may visit the uh, website, which is simply www.pgahc.org forward slash poet laureate. And uh, you'll find the link for submittable, which is the platform through which all poems must be submitted. They do not come to me. They go to the uh, submittable platform, which is directly available on the Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council website on the Poet Laureate page. So uh, we'll make sure that that link gets put in the chat before we conclude today's conversations. 
Uh, Joran, thank you so much for sharing with us today. And uh, certainly we wish you all the best, uh, continued success. I understand also that the Prince George's Youth Poet Laureate Program is currently accepting applications for candidates who wish to compete for the 2022 Youth Poet Laureate position. So uh, if Patrick Washington is still with us, Patrick, please put that link in the chat uh, for dialect that allows persons to know about the process and apply to be a candidate. I believe that deadline also concludes on December the 3rd. So there's some great stuff happening for poets and poetry right here in Prince George's County. And uh, for those that don't get the information uh, right now, I'm gonna put my email uh, in this chat so that, uh, let's see, persons can reach out to me and uh, make sure that you get the information in a timely manner. Yeah, there we go. Be in touch and I'll certainly forward information to anyone, but also the uh, Prince George's Arts and Humanities website is always an option to go where you can go directly to the Poet Laureate page. So we wanna make sure we, we deadlines are looming and we, we're thrilled with the applicant with the poems that we've already received. We've gotten a wonderful start, but we want to make sure that we have the opportunity to get as many poets in the anthology as possible. And the target publication date is uh, the end of 2022. So although the deadline is imminent, uh, it's going to take some time for the applicant for the actual book to be published to come about. So we want to get everybody in that can get in. Please submit and we'll be in touch. Okay, at this time, we're gonna turn to our third guest poet. And as it uh, becomes apparent, we're speaking of none other than Cliff Bernier. Cliff, welcome, welcome, welcome to this episode of From a Poet's Point of View. Thank you so much, Sister Joy. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, as has been done for each of our two previous guest poets, let me share a little bit about Cliff before I engage him in conversation. Uh, Cliff uh, is the author of three poetry collections. His The Silent Art, <coughs> excuse me, won the 2010 Javal Press Poetry Award. His most recent poems are part of the book, The Right Blend, a collaboration between six DC area poets celebrating diversity. His poems are also included in a Baltimore County Arts Guild EC. <coughs> and Cliff, you'll have to tell us what that EC stands for, Poetry and Prose Sponsored Ekphrastic Poetry Exhibition. Uh, Cliff also appears on harmonica in the Accumulated Dust World Music Series. He is quite the jazz and blues man, trust me. <laughs> uh, a member of the Washington Writers Collection. He has featured, well, he has been featured on NPR's The Poet and the Poem from the Library of Congress with Grace Cavallari. So <clears throat> we see, Cliff, that um, there's poetry and there's music that you've chosen as your forms of expression. Uh, we look forward to hearing about the balance between these two disciplines. It is my great pleasure and privilege to invite poet and musician Cliff Bernier to join us as a featured guest poet in this November session of From a Poet's Point of View. Cliff, welcome to Thank our you. program today. Thank you so much. Honored to be here. Well, 
we're honored and we want to make sure that our guests have the full experience of Cliff as both the poet and the musician. I didn't ask you to, to perform for us, but I know how you tie in your music and your poetry. And uh, before the day is out, hopefully our guests will have a taste of that. But um, certainly, Cliff, what what is it that brought you to poetry? What I mean, there's so much that you offer through your artistry. Uh, certainly, what are your poetic influences? Well, um, poetry just sort of uh, came to me. I um, lived overseas as a kid um, and um, initially didn't have many friends, if any friends. So I began reading and then um, writing at night uh, um, in my bed. And uh, it came out as poetry. Uh, so that, that's how I started. Um, Were there poets that you heard? You know, I don't remember that. I don't remember um, having read poetry or, or trying to copy somebody or being inspired by anyone. It's just when I started to write, it came out in broken lines and, and the form of poems. Um, Later, you know, I did start to read and I kind of um, grew up in the, the cla Western classical tradition of poetry. Um, T.S. Eliot, um, W.B. Yeats, uh, Wallace Stevens. And then um, when I got into college, I was exposed to Derek Walcott and he really opened things up for me with um, his language and um, the realization that uh, it, it didn't have to be a formal um, uh, English English or American English. There were other Englishes and you could do other things with the language that right. were creative and inventive and, and musical and, and, um, and have something to say. So it, it didn't have to fit all the uh, structural guidelines of prose that uh, freed you up quite a bit, I'm sure. Yeah. That, that was a, a revelation to me. Okay, okay. So when when you talk about poetry uh, for you, what what does poetry mean to you? What is poetry? What is the role of poetry in your life? Well, I, I, it's kind of um, become a way to understand the world. Um, I find that I'm interested in origins and um, and epistemology. The the um, what does that origin? mean? Epistemology. What does that mean? It, it's the uh, it's the uh, search for um, the way you know something. It's a, a philosophical term that um, I, I think I have a definition here. Uh, the theory of knowledge is what okay. they call it. And um, so getting actually, to I, the guts of it. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't grow up going to church, um, um, but I'm I'm a spiritual person, and I I. I wanted to know. I needed to have that um, that basis, and so uh, poetry for me has been a way to to find that spirituality and to uh, understand the world. Okay, so as as in the epistles, got it. Okay, so with regard to uh, po what is the role for poetry in society? Let's take it off cliff. Let's talk about the big picture from your vantage point. What is the role of poetry for society? Well, I think it it it, it um, articulates in a memorable way um, what we think and feel. You know, what's universal and what binds us together. Um, our hopes and our dreams, our happinesses, our concerns, our angers and our fears. It's it's what gives voice to um, to us. And um, the 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 lines that we remember speak for us. And I think that's what what poetry can do. Um, it can be uh, uh, an expression and it can be an agent of change. Okay, well, certainly, uh, I think all of us on this call agree about poetry as a change agent and as poets as change agents. Uh, when, when you look at your journey as a poet, and, and you, yours is a bit different because your journey is also that of a musician, and uh, of course, the connection between poetry and music has well been established 
So we don't need to consider that an alternative, but an augmentation from my vantage point anyway. But uh, when you talk about your journey as a poet, and I understand that you've been a bit of a traveler as well with your poetry. Talk to us about uh, how, how does poetry open uh, doors of conversation or experiences for you as you travel? Well, it's, it's uh, I, um, people are people all over the world. <laughs> and and um, um, we, we share the same um, uh, emotions and desires and hopes and fears and poetry um, speaks to all of them. Um, I've, I've performed in, in Germany and um, um, in, in England and in other places and it's, 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 it's people. Um, and, 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 the, and the musicality of words feeds into that and um, so the, the music um, complements the poetry and um, over time I've, I've put them together. Uh, now, when you talk about putting them together, let's see, there's, there's a comment here from Anne that says, Cliff, you said poetry is a way for you to understand the world. What about a way for, for you to understand yourself? Isn't that also a poet's quest? Could you respond to that? <laughs> it's true. It's, it's a it's a good point. Um, th that's where the lyrical poems come in, and um, I, I guess you know uh, we that they're intertwined. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding the world and understanding yourself um, is is understanding your place in it. Um, and there are times when you just need a catharsis and you need to express your emotions. Um, and, and there are times when you're reaching for something more intellectual and a kind of a framework to, to understand what's happening. So, I mean, it's, it's not an either or, they're, all, they're always intertwined in some way. What pulled you most to write a poem? There's a little voice inside my head that um, that is speaking to me and um, and and wants to be uh, remembered on paper. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the best poems come to me out of nowhere. It's just um, a, a, a phrase or a line um, that comes to me, and I want to capture it. Yeah, I've had that experience where <laughs> you don't know why, but it just resonates. Yes. Okay, so how about we hear a poem um, from Cliff Bernier? Maybe the first one won't have the music, but maybe the second one will. Uh, okay. Cliff, why don't you uh, offer a poem that you feel really is representative of who you are as a poet and, and, uh, and discuss why before you even share the poem? <laughs> okay, um, well, this is... Um... And I, I'm going to call him Patty on on this one. <laughs> um, th this is one that I wrote for um, the uh, Baltimore County Arts Guild um, ephrastic poetry uh, exhibition um, that will be uh, presented tomorrow in um, near, in Catonsville near Baltimore. Um, and um, this is the event that Patty is, has uh, put on. And she can tell us what EC stands for in the EC Poetry Exhibition. Okay, okay, we'll, do, we'll, <laughs> we'll come back to her after you share your poem. So, um, but it, it was, a, uh, if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll do this uh, one. It's um, based on a painting um, uh, called Turning the Page. Okay. And so before I, I start, I'll say, I guess this is one of the, the more um, kind of philosophical uh, poems that uh, it's not a poem that was written with music in mind. It was a, um, uh, a, an idea that, you know, a word has a meaning by itself, but when you put it next to another word, word it changes its meaning. And, um, and so anything put next to something else changes a thing. Absolutely. Um, and um, so, uh, I mean, just, just that fact makes it social. 
um, and it, and it um, influence, influences our exponential. So that was kind of the idea behind this. And that, as I was writing it, I had some other revelations. And I think th those are the, the best kinds of poems when you discover something in the process of writing. Yes. It's, a, it's an act of learning and, and discovery. That's, that's yeah. what we want. And, OK, so, we want to make sure everybody's mic is off as the poets are presenting. So to each of our guests, if you happen to have your mic on, please make sure your mics are now turned off. Uh, Cliff, thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing your poem. OK, um, get a little water. Turning the page. As the juxtaposition of words unlocks meanings neither had, and as summer colors autumn with new meaning, like waves on a beach, let's turn the page. The trees are yellow brown and red within green. The words lead to waves rolling like recitation, leaves of this book that keep turning. And the wind tumbling toward winter is the last word of the last poem that explains everything and nothing juxtaposed with spring. So part of the idea is the cyclic nature of, of life, of, of existence, of things. And how- do you, remember, do you remember the word that pulled you to that poem? Or the experience? Um, it was thinking about the juxtaposition of things. Okay. And and it, it just dawned on me that a word by itself is one thing, and a word next to another thing is something else. And that's the, that was the Got impetus it. for the poem. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sometimes Great. it's something just as so small as that, and it leads to bigger ideas. <laughs> right. And that's, that's the power of words. That's absolutely the beauty and the power of words because uh, they can explode conceptually and in, uh, into sometimes a beautiful poem. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, so um, let's see. I, I want to uh, take a moment to hear from uh, your, hear your second poem. But before we do, I see that uh, we have a special guest in our audience that I want to acknowledge. And uh, that person is uh, Yvette Caldwell, who is the Prince George's Arts and Humanities Board Chair. Uh, please do take a moment to say hello to our guest, if you can, Ms. Caldwell. Hello, good afternoon. I'm sorry, I can't be on camera right now because I'm in a project, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> but I am so honored to be here. This is just so enlightening and enriching. It's a wonderful opportunity to, to be exposed to wonderful poetry. Thank you so much, Sister Joy, for all your leadership and all that you do to raise the awareness in this county and beyond as it relates to poetry. And thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the afternoon with you all. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for your words. Okay. Well, again, this is now Cliff Bernier presenting his second poem. And Cliff, is there something you'd care to tell us about this piece? Um, yeah, sure. Um, this one, um, well, as you mentioned earlier, I um, I love the blues. I, I love yes. jazz. Um, this is a poem about the blues. And um, as, as you probably know, the, the blues um, uh, grew out of largely this uh, American South and, um, and followed the Mississippi River up to Chicago, where it became electrified. But um, the roots of it are in, in, the, uh, in the American South. But, all over the world, there are musics. Every culture has its form of blues. There are uh, sad uh, or melancholy uh, uh, kinds of music in every in every culture, and um, there are rivers in every country. So, um, 
those those ideas kind of intertwine to inspire this poem. Um, and um, so it's a celebration of um, uh, the rivers of the world and the the um, the blues musics of the world. It's called All the Rivers. Okay, All the Rivers by Cliff Bernier. And I'll accompany myself on uh, harmonica. This is a, uh, I, I should say also that um, um, I, I collaborated with a, a Portuguese music duo on the, uh, the world music uh, series called Accumulated Dust. And this poem was set to music on the um, EP um, Post-Columbian America. And it can be found on YouTube. Um, it can be purchased on Bandcamp and Spotify and I think um, Apple Music. Um, but if you can get it for free on the internet as well, on well, YouTube. Please make sure you leave that information in the chat, how they can do that. If you can. Okay, sure. Um, and he did a great job. He, uh, um, the percussionist um, is the composer, and he did, did a great job putting this together. Um, I do the vocal on it and, um, and the harmonica, uh, which he synthesized. <laughs> so um, sounds a little different, but um, all the rivers. All the rivers run to the Mississippi. <laughs> The Amazon, the Nile, the Yangtze, the Ganges, the Piranhas, the Dows, the Ducks, and the Dead. From Itasca to the source they come, the Ob, the Euphrates, revolutionaries and reeds, refractions of silt and of self, on longboats and junks, tugboats and rafts, the Lena, the Congo, the Yellow, the Seine. All the rivers run to the Mississippi. Ride the steamers from Dubuc to Davenport, from Hannibal to St. Louis, prism of hardship and pain. The Thames, the Mekong, Bifado, Flamenco, Gospels, Spirituals, Bolero, and Tango. From Jackson to Memphis, from Helena to Clarksdale, pour their stories into the Delta, their sorrows into the redemption of song. All the rivers run to the Mississippi. <laughs> All the rivers run to the Mississippi. The Volga, the Rhine, Nantaro, Niabarongo, by headwaters and streams, Morna, Anka, Bossa, and Chant. Hop the paddle boats from Rosedale to Greenville, steer the barges from Vicksburg to Baton Rouge, Natchez to New Orleans, a confluence of currents, the Zambezi, the Tagus, the Purus, the Brahma, because all the rivers run to the blues. Thank you. Incredible. Okay, Cliff Brenier. Cliff, when did you come to the point of realization that the harmonica was the perfect partner for your poetry? <laughs> uh, it, it, it just happened organically. Um, I, I wrote poems uh, long before I started playing the harmonica, um, but I was around um, 19 or 20 years old. I started playing and um, I actually stopped writing and uh, playing for about 20 years, um, raising a family and working. And then when I came back to them, um, they, they, they found each other fairly quickly. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we're certainly very happy that they did. Uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, artistry. Uh, with regard to, uh, are you, uh, and I know you mentioned that there's an event that you and Patty are about to do tomorrow. Patty, can I call you back online and ask you to tell us about 
the event that I understand. Is it you who, who coordinated this event? Is this an event that you produced? Tell us about it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I and I did put a link into the um, chat. The um, so I've been working with the Baltimore County Arts Guild, and um, the Arts Guild just took over a piece of property in Catonsville, the uh, Catonsville Catonsville Women's Clubhouse, and in doing so, um, they were looking to have some exhibits there. And about uh, in 2019, I think it was 2019, I did in a um, what we call an ephrastic show, which is basically where the poets write pieces to the paintings. And so um, I, these two phenomenal painters, uh, April Rimpo and Elaine Wiener-Reed, those are two watercolorists internationally known. Uh, Elaine has a shop down in Annapolis and, um, and April's around. And so I reached out to them as a part of just trying to get some exhibits at the, um, at the Guild. And we came up with deciding we would do an ephrastic show again. And, um, you know, I think I told you earlier, like I love to hear the poetry of other poets. Right. So I just sort of gathered up a few people. Um, and, um, and of course, Cliff was, was one of them. I was like, okay, I, you know, you know, you're sitting around. So I had a couple of girlfriends. I was like, oh, who's my god friends, right? Like I gotta go to my list for god friends. So, so I, um, and, uh, and so there's going to be about uh, eight of us, eight or nine of us tomorrow that will be reading to the works of, um, of April and, um, and Elaine. And the show is up through the end of, um, till December uh, 20th. But one of the things that I had mentioned before when I was talking about the muralist who's, um, who Jaren, you, you'll, I'm going to, connect you with Jay because he's down in Southern Maryland and Clinton as well. And um, when Jay was talking about cross-pollination, that's one of the things that April Elaine and I have been talking about doing ever since 2019. And so um, we, we, when they put the show together then, they had a musical group come out. And then of course, those of us that read to the poetry. So we're kind of recreating that now with that coming back in and adding in some more folks and some more stuff. And I think I was telling you, I have the pick for um, Cliff's uh, poem that he, he read um, for it. And so I didn't know if you wanted me to share screen. Um, I was trying to find mine, so I wouldn't put that on Cliff. <laughs> See if I could find mine because I had um, I had a short short poem for for mine um, that I had written, but it's it's a pretty cool project. I did put the link in the um, in the uh, chat, and um, it's tomorrow afternoon from three to five. Is it live or virtual? Um, it's in person. It's so live. it's in person. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's in person and um, we are, th there are going to be videographers there. So there'll be a bunch of clips out there at some point in the world um, for folks to view. And if I get some, I'll, I'll shoot them your way so that, you can, um, so that you can see them. But yeah, it's going to be a pretty cool event. Um, when I did it in 2019, it's really interesting when you're looking at the paintings and you're reading to the paintings and as you're reading, you're looking at your audience that's reading to you. So it's this real whole like spiritual experience, right? Right. And it's pretty, it's pretty amazing because it's really, you know, almost this sort of like kaleidoscope of emotions and colors and everything coming together. Um, so it's a really cool experience, and I, I, I like Frastic shows. I hope that we'll have an opportunity to do more, um, more like that. Okay. Now, Cliff said to ask you about the EC in the title. Oh, the EC is El it's, so when I first Ellicott started City. doing it's Ellicott City. Yeah. When okay. I first started okay. doing um, open mics, I did it down in Ellicott City at um, gotcha. Syrianas at a um, Syrian restaurant. Which, Jorin, it's interesting that you talk about that in terms of refugees because we had um, so many attendants, and it was really interesting to me too that um, you know the refugee story. Just so you know, like I know we talk about me and the, and the Black History thing. But the refugee story is so similar to the stories of those of us that have been uh, marginalized in this country that come from the enslaved population. So it's really interesting when you start to look at those two stories. And I remember somebody was like, oh, well, Syriana is like, that's a Syrian restaurant. Like, what does that have to do with it? And then we had our first event and um, 
a lot of the Syrians who were, you know, in their traditional wear and everything like that were snapping and, you know, and it was just, it was really great. So okay. nice, again, cross-cultural sort of experiences. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm very happy to uh, hear about it. I'm looking forward to getting, I won't make it to Baltimore. I know I won't, but uh, certainly we want to get uh, any video footage or clips that you can share. Uh, we'll post them uh, where, wherever we can. I know I have five Facebook pages that I maintain, so we'll spread them around there and uh, the Arts Council can uh, support however we can. So all the best, all the best to, to you and to Cliff. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, had a wonderful uh, series now. The three of you have presented your poetry and your views. We want to make sure that um, before we move away from uh, the actual conversation with the guest poets, uh, everybody mark your calendars for December 18th, Saturday, December 18th, 1 to 3 p.m. for the final 2021 episode of From a Poet's Point of View. And we're, we're excited because we're gonna take this final experience and bring in three poet, youth poetry ambassadors. So we're gonna have Imani West, we're gonna have Deja Epps, and we're gonna have Deon Coleman. So just as you heard the uh, beauty and the power of Joran Ellison representing the Youth Poet Laureate Program of Prince George's County, three of her peers are going to be with us next month to close out the series from a poet's point of view. But what better way can we look to the future but then to hear from the voices of our youngest poets. So um, the, again, that date is Saturday, December 18th. And I'm hoping that each of you that's with us today will be with us on uh, our closeout session. And uh, we'll be announcing at that time what 2022 looks like, because as many of you have heard, uh, I have been asked to uh, stay on as Poet Laureate for one more year. So I am uh, going to continue this work, which means that I've got to figure out, hmm, what's my year four series title going to be? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll try to make it, well, our first year was uh, the po Poet Laureate Reading Series. So that was kind of introducing the concept to folks. The second year was um, literacy through poetry. And we had a wonderful experience with that, which shifted from live to virtual midway. And then, of course, this year we've done this series from a poet's point of view, really getting people, allowing people to get inside the mind and, and the heart and soul of poets, not just to hear a poem or two, but to understand their thought process, the creative process. And that's what we want people to understand that poetry is something that is available and accessible to everybody. So, uh, you know, all you need to do is just give thought to what if, whatever it is you want, because there's no right or wrong on the views. Um, I mean, you know, while, Certainly, we don't want anybody to go out and, and uh, make take a platform to say, I am the authority on, and <laughs> that's not what poetry is about. But you certainly can tell your truth through poetry. And we, we're hoping that uh, we have some new voices to come. And certainly for those that have never been published before, we're hoping that you will consider submitting your poem, your three poems, one, two, or three poems for consideration of publication in the poetry anthology, which again will be titled uh, Poets That Dance With Words. And uh, these are poets that are located within the DMV. So we're looking to hear from you. We've got a a good cache of poems already in stock that have uh, been trickling in since the uh, window was opened. I think it was what, uh, about two weeks ago, but uh, we've got about another two weeks to go. So please let us hear from you. Okay, so now we have some time that allows us to do a little bit of open mic. So that's always a fun time because we never know who's going to share what. And um, I generally try to find something that, um, well, hopefully that connects the viewers to 
this experience as a and to become a part of the conversation. So we are now asking you <coughs> to uh, consider taking off your hat of voyeur and take on your, your the mantle of uh, turn that mic high. Okay, so uh, we we have a poem that uh, well I have a poem that I'd like to share. It's really a work in progress. I just I just started working on it two days ago. What's today? Well, three days ago now. But I didn't come back to it uh, as I had thought I would. But I'm going to share uh, what I've started, and uh, maybe uh, next month I may share the completed poem. Who knows? But uh, if you are interested in being a part of the open mic, then all you need to do is put your name in the chat and then put open mic beside your name. We will call on you in the order that your name appears in the chat. Uh, I would say two poems per poet would be, I think, a reasonable uh, amount of uh, time. Uh, poems generally two minutes or less. Uh, we, we don't want we don't want epics. <laughs> we want to allow uh, as many poets to uh, share as possible. And uh, this open mic is also open for our three poets who are our guest poets. As a matter of fact, I'm really hoping that each of our guest poets will share at least one more poem uh, during the open mic segment that we have now entered. So, uh, the poem that I'm going to share is titled Survival. That blast was not a truck backfire. Two minutes later, scout cars speed by, lights flashing, sirens blaring. Folk in this neighborhood seem immune to such sounds. Sirens after shots mean something different here. Mothers check for their young children, but otherwise rhythms go, <clears throat> go unaltered, unaffected. Children can't be but so protected on these streets. So when you hear backfires or gunshots, you cast a glance over your shoulder, over your children, but you don't miss a beat. You don't ask questions and you sure don't answer any, lest the street catch your name next time. What was that? Okay, so something that uh, I was uh, moved to write after finding myself in a quite uncomfortable setting this past week. But we write, that's what we poets do, we write. Okay, so I see that uh, Marie Blake is listed in the open mic. Marie, welcome. And Marie, tell us something about yourself. Who is Marie Blake? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I have, um, I am a, I'm glad to be here. I've enjoyed the program so far. I am a retired teacher from DC Public Schools and I've been writing for a long time. I haven't published a lot, but some. Uh, I published a calendar with some of my poetry on it. And um, I work with the DC Area Writing Project, uh, teaching, showing teachers how to teach writing better uh, after I retired from the system. So uh, today I'm going to read a poem that was given as an assignment in a summer institute. And we had to write something but not use proper nouns. So that means you had to be creative in, in describing what you wanted. So even though you, uh, see if you can, you know what I'm talking about. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. The name of this poem is Existence. I am. I am from the chocolate city via a state where cotton grows wild. The road to here wound through a place where great black educators and the famous peanut scientists worked and played. 
where whites and blacks loved but hated in the name of I am better than you because you and your ancestors grew from the continent of sun, trees, plains, and land. So, and land so arid that the clay cracked and drank itself dry. I exist. I am a black woman born of parents who paid $100 for the land on which a house was built, in which my father died because the same land which produced cotton and peanuts also produced iron ore. That land ate him up and spewed him out, so he was no more on this side of the universe. I exist. I am going to remember my past and look toward my future, where the next generation is coming to be. Their heads filled with the things of today, not knowing or caring about memories of yesterday. But I will remind them of the yesterdays and the yesteryears and of the men and women who made it possible for them to be. I am. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. And how recent did you write that? That is pretty old. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, it's, well, I guess around, probably around 2010, 20, okay. I mean, okay. 10, 11 or something of that nature. Well, thank you for sharing it here today, Marie Blake. And we hope you come back next month and uh, maybe share another po uh, poem during next month's open mic. I will. I, will. <laughs> I was not signed up for this. I mean, I didn't know about that it was going on. Okay. But I will be back next. And that's my birthday, by the way, December 18th. Oh! So I'll come and celebrate my birthday with there you. There you go. Well, we poets love to celebrate birthdays through poetry. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much again. And well, well. Okay. Uh, let's see now. The next uh, name that I saw under after Marie was, oh, our uh, one of our uh, guest poets, Joran Ellison. Welcome back, Joran. What do you have for us? Um, this is more of a fun poem, um, but I wrote it to like practice my alliteration skills um, or practice different flows. Okay. <clears throat> oh, it's called Love is a Battlefield. Sorry. Scab, scab over and like conditional love, we still pick at it. Hoping we can get a bit of our blood spilled from the first war back so your love be like a battlefield. Dodging your personal buttons that cause my personal destruction, tripping over your triggers which trigger hails of insulting and patronizing gunfire, a gun for hire, standing guard at my heart, but he'd be too easily swayed by your persuasive ways. Allowing you into these castles and courts, you court a young lady, maybe in hopes of making me jealous since you know I will soon hear of it, but you use her. As you do everybody, hold her body hostage for your plans to invade and take over this land acting like, I, like Columbus or I suppose any man who grew up thinking war is the only way to gain freedom. That oppressing others is the only way you can see a happy medium in a relationship. Ships from your land arrive on my coast in hopes of stealing that which does not belong to them to change the landscape to your view so you feel comfortable in a place tired of shifting its mountains for your pleasure. But you don't care. You continue to measure and predict the extent of the blast before pushing the red button causing gas and black smoke, dust and mushroom clouds that disintegrate any semblance of hope for no mass casualties. And I lay here, shell shocked from the blast, wishing for this war I didn't ask to be in to finally pass. And I wish you knew that. I wish you knew that this war will only make body bags out of both of our homelands. And yet you persist. Shots fired at my chest and I sit in the trenches with my back turned and fingers looped, praying you miss. Praying you miss me enough to call me back to our once peaceful home country Hoping this land isn't as desecrated as I believe it to be. Hoping this land is still running free with no blood left over from the first war or this one flowing through the streets. Thank you. Wow. Now, Joran Ellison, I have to ask the question. You said, oh, this is going to be a fun piece. I had some fun with alliteration. Oh, this, this doesn't sound like a fun piece to me. This is a very serious message, young lady. <laughs> I, I love the piece. I absolutely, but uh, you, you gave me a whiplash when you told me it was going to be a fun piece. <laughs> meant, Thank, go ahead. I meant fun for me to perform. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, got it. Got it. Well, there's all types of uh, things that go in the process of presenting poetry. So I do understand. Uh, and, and your presentation of the poem was excellent, of course. Uh, very. Is that some a poem that you are known for? A particular poem that you're well known for? 
Um, I, I haven't performed at a lot of places. No? So it's kind of new. So, um, I mean, it's one of my favorite pieces right now, though, but it's kind of new. Okay, okay. Well, uh, I love the message and, and your presentation was like excellent. So um, definitely any audience would be blessed to hear that piece. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving down the list of, let's see, after Joran, we have, oh, Patty, Patty, welcome back to the open mic. Patty? Little pie. Yep, I'm there. Sorry, I was just trying to find find it to uh, to un unmic myself. Okay. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm gonna uh, give heads up to after little pie is Cliff uh, on open mic again. So um, I'm just gonna take it in a little bit different direction. This is one okay. of the more traditional poems okay. for me. Um, this poem is titled "My West African Grandmother." Um, it did. It did, uh, it is in the, I think the most recent pen in hand, but it was also in the Rising Phoenix River Review, um, which is an online sign. My West African grandmother. I hope to go to Senegal to see La Rosa, a pink tarn of salt, sun beaten and gummy. Lingering shoreside, I watch my guide Ahmed rub shea butter over his full body, gliding into the sticky mare the everyday work of the poor, sun catchers. I am reminded how grandma sifted boiled dough into a small pot of butter, preparation for the salty bean broth. I should go to Gory Island, visit the Monson d'Ansclaves and see the white sand beaches, the palm trees contrasting the whales that must have been from a door swinging solely one way. I must go to Bagni and watch Mother Fatu smoke the fish in small concrete tombs filled with fire and ash daily, the air heavy and grave on her lungs. They are replacing the tombs now, furnaces, modern, not aged, no smoke, no ash. Will the Tobandin taste the same? Jollof rice and fish with no tang of smoke? want to see my grandmother who has aged and is dying, her salty bean broth, the smell of smoked fish, a family heirloom. I hope to go to Senegal. Thank you. What a wonderful tribute to your grandmother. Okay, <laughs> yes, <clears throat> beautiful. Thank you so much, little pie. Okay, and now we will hear from our, our third uh, guest poet, Cliff Bernier. And uh, Miss, Miss Cayenne, you're on deck. So Cliff Bernier, welcome back. Thanks, Sister Joy. So um, the last poem I did was a poem about the blues. This is a, a blues poem, a little bit of a difference. Um, and it's one that was on, um, the Poetry X hunger site um, that Hiram LaRue uh, administers. And um, he asked me to present it at the Alliance to End Hunger Summit that was online a few weeks ago. Um, I, I'm not much of a political po poet, um, more of a social justice uh, issues one. And I guess you could call this a social justice issue. It's a poem about hunger. It's called Bacon and Egg Blues. Woke up this morning, got the bacon and egg blues. Woke up this morning, got the bacon and egg blues. Got no bacon, eggs too rotten to use. I'll make some coffee, sweeten it with milk. I'll make me some coffee, sweeten it with milk. Milk's gone sour, gotta dump it in the sink. Toast me some bread, gotta get something to eat. Toast me some bread, gotta have something to eat. Bread's all moldy, couldn't weather the heat.
I'll raid the pantry, eat some canned beans. I'll raid the pantry, maybe eat some canned beans. Shelves are empty, no cans to be seen. Woke up this morning, got the bacon and egg blues. Woke up this morning, got the bacon and egg blues. Got no bacon, got nothing to lose. Cliff Brett, yay. Woo, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Cliff. And uh, let's see, moving right along, we've got a few, let's see, we have Miss Cayenne. Welcome, Miss Cayenne. We're very happy to have you with us today. What do you have for us? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I have a piece that, um, this is a more recent piece as well. It was probably, this is one of those pieces where I, I felt the need to self-encourage. So it's called Filling in the Blanks. Um, filling in the blanks. I see doors being swung open, busted down in a jar with easy access for. I see windows flung open, prop up and open wide for. I see a long table with place settings, table tents with names and an empty space with a chair pushed back waiting for. I see a kind, bold, fearlessly fearful and unapologetically authentic me. Filling in the blanks of dreams, visions and revelations I dare not speak out loud. But today I dare to dream out loud, aloud, just loud. And I can care less about the noise ordinance stipulated in your small imagination. I will play my existence on max till the roots of old oaks feel the vibration and dance with me. I will give a hard twist to right to the right to the volume bleeds through the walls of limitation. So go ahead and call the cops if the sound of my inhale and exhale is too much for you. My resolve to be is too loud for you. If my baseline is too deep for you, go ahead. But I shall not be squelched. I cannot be quieted. So every time I walk into a room, there's a sound. It's the overdue sound of me daring to dream out loud, aloud, just loud. And where I used to fear even whispering my name, it's the confident sound of the answer, me. It's me I see stepping across the threshold of opened doors. It's me I see receiving from wide, wide, wide windows. It's me I see sitting at the table. So like I said before, I will play my existence on Max. I cannot, will not be quieted. I cannot, will not reduce my volume. I cannot will not any longer dream on mute. I cannot, I will not disappoint my creator's cause. Instead, I will boldly, fearlessly, unapologetically fill in the blanks with the answer, me. Thank you. Woo, 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 Miss Kyan. Thank you, thank you so much. That's what I'm talking about. Fill in the blanks. Me. Okay. Um, always strong. Always strong. Love it. Yes. Cliff Bernier says, always strong, Miss Cayenne. Bravo. Absolutely. Okay. Well, you get much love, everybody, throughout the chat. I hope everybody is paying attention to the comments in the chat uh, for each of our presenters today. Um, I was hoping to uh, get one of our uh, young men. Um, who just said boom <laughs> in the chat. I'm calling you out. If you can, you got something for us, we'd love to have you. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, as we uh, wind down today that everybody that wanted to, uh, that I didn't overlook anybody in the chat, uh, if anybody has anything that they would like to share uh, poetry-wise or an announcement about poetry. Now, it, it does need to be a PSA about poetry. 
but we've made two announcements already. And one is, of course, the anthology, which I'm hoping all the poets that we heard from today are submitting for the anthology. That's number one. That, that's a given. I, I just, that, that's not even a question. And number two, that uh, anybody who is in touch with teen poets, I think the age range is 13 to 19. Is that right, Patrick or, or Joran? for uh, candidates for the, um, the uh, Youth Poet Laureate uh, program for Prince George's County. Uh, applications do need to be in by uh, December the 3rd or 4th. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to ask um, Sherry Moore if she will uh, come on mic and uh, talk to us about the cultural arts study that uh, is gonna be out in December. There's information in the chat, but Sherry, please come come out and uh, share some information that uh, you've shared in the mic, if you would. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm still trying to recover from the uh, poetry. I'm just kind of blown away here, uh, as I always am. Always a rich experience. But um, we uh, last week the preliminary. Uh, findings just uh, came out about uh, the Prince George's Cultural Arts Study. Um, I put the website um, on in the chat, um, the recording from, uh, it's the initial preliminary findings uh, that were laid out. That recording is not up, I just checked. But um, if you have not um, had a chance to go to the website, um, we, I put it there. Um, the uh, a draft will be coming out later December. Uh, we will try and get that draft or send the link out to everybody. We really would like to have your feedback if there's something missing. And that again, this is uh, for Prince George's County and um, we would love to have your voice um, and your eyes. Uh, to just to say this is if, if there's something missing there that you're not seeing uh, we really want this is your your study um, it, it is a study and your comments will uh, then be um, help inform an actual plan that will be put into place so um, thank you for everyone who attended and thank you thank you to all the participating artist. I mean, I'm really, and, and the participants that shared it, I'm just really blown away. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that information. And uh, as, as I said earlier, we want to make sure that uh, for those that are not familiar with how to save the chat, to hold on to all this wonderful information, the links and everything, if you look at the very bottom of the chat, uh, across from the last person's name, uh, it's, it's, you see three little dots. Those dots are called ellipses. If you click on the ellipses, you'll see the word save chat. And then you click again, and that is that chat now becomes a part of your directory. Uh, even after you leave Zoom, uh, you go to your, uh, I think it's under documents, but you can save it to a specific location if you want. But uh, all the information, is available to you and you can uh, access those links at any time. And uh, also um, the contact information for each of our guest poets. I'm hoping each of the three have now put their contact information or information about any of their publications that uh, they wanted to uh, let folks know how to get a hold of. That is absolutely what we want to make sure is in there. And the uh, information, I think Little Pie already put in there about her event tomorrow. So um, we want to support our poets whenever and however we can. Uh, if you have a PSA that you want to type in there real quick uh, about Poetry Matters, now's the time to do it as we're winding down. But we're going to have a fabulous close out. And I'm so very happy and honored that uh, Patrick Washington has agreed to close us out uh, for our November 2021 session of From a Poet's Point of View, which is to me the perfect closeout. So Patrick, welcome to the session and thank you for stepping up. What do you have for us to close out today's episode of From a Poet's Point of View? <laughs> Sister Joe, you know I can't say no to you, so. Uh, this this is, uh, uh, it, it's a pleasure. Good to see everybody, uh, Lopai and uh, Cliff. 
um, uh, and, and join, of course, uh, very, you did a great job. Um, I'm very happy to see everybody. This, that, that little, where is it? Yeah, that, yeah. My, I just realized I had a virtual background. I have another event later on and I set this up for that. So forgive the, the weird background. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, so my job is basically, you know, to amplify these young voices. So uh, this piece is in that vein. It's called, it's from a KRS one uh, line. The title is, it's called in five seconds, a teacher will begin to speak. Before Patrick says another word, I did not properly introduce Patrick. Patrick is the founder and director for the Prince George's County and other jurisdictions, but Youth Poet Laureate Program. So he is uh, here uh, observing his protege, Jordan Ellison, who he just gave kudos for doing a great job, which he did. But uh, Patrick, thank you for the incredible work that you're doing, ushering our young poets to that next plateau. And um, the Youth Poet Laureate Program announcement, I'm sure you've already put the link in the chat. Yes. Okay. Okay, yes. so uh, anybody who has questions about that, uh, Patrick is the person that you're going to be in touch with as far as uh, the Youth Poet Laureate of Prince George's County. Yes, 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 yeah, definitely. Uh, um, I'm open to uh, hearing from any young person, uh, you know, between the ages of 13 and 19, even if you're out, outside of Prince George's County at this point, because um, there's a place for you. That's right. There's a, yeah, there's definitely a place for you. So uh, this is for all of the kids who wither away in classroom boxes and cicada themselves out windows as soon as the teacher begins, leaving empty shells behind. You know, the ones who whine, what's geometry really for? I'm never going to use it. You know, those colossal kids who shrink under spotlight, expecting to hear the words freeze, stop. But instead from us, they hear go, move. Now's your time. But always loosen up first. Deep breath, everyone. Inhale the up rock pause to think. Exhale the MC staring. Don't blink. Don't you ever let them tell you that you need laser cartridges or high priced anythings. All you need is your voice, your hands, comfortable shoes, and the will. But you still talk in geometry, so okay. Are all hip hop beats quadrilateral? Depending on the location of the center of rotation, can you tell me the diameter of this cameo record? Is there any symmetry to this picture? What is the radius of a fifth grader's windmill? How much area will three cans of spray paint cover? Yes. The metaphors I spit have always been three dimensional because I've been doing this since Converse. I am a teacher, helping young people to discover their mutant power since 2000 and whenever, like how to make canvas chromatically explode, how to free entire crowds and all how to reach through milk crate portals pulling historic singers back to life simply to play with the musicians of today and it won't be easy some days the floor will feel indifferent trains will break down like cracked albums and friends some friends will morph away into shadow but then what there is a long, hard walk back to your seat unless you stand on your own to show and prove. Let them all know who's got the props. You can ante up and ace that contest, grab that diploma, but don't just get a job, create one. That's what we're given. The extra bop in your step as you stride into any office, any cipher, art gallery, or across any stage to speak with conviction and with rhythm. To find colors and scenes yet unseen and still hidden, this has been always been our mission. We are teachers. And we don't want you to just rock a crowd. We expect you to rock the world. Okay, that's how you close out the episode for November 2021. Thank you, Patrick. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. We are teachers. Yes, work to be done. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us today. Be in touch. Save the chat. See you next month. And remember, always pick up a pen and keep writing. Love you. Thank you, Sister Joy. You're very welcome. Thank you.